Hello, this is the Sacred Money series. I'm Natalie Kent from Sacred Business. And today we have a guest who you may already know. His name is Tad Hargrave. He's from marketingforhippies.com. <laughs> and he is a bit of a rogue in the marketing sphere. He works with conscious and green business owners. And today we're going to be delving into his take on point of view marketing and money. So welcome to the series, Tad. It's I'm going Tad. to begin by saying that uh, every single person I mentioned that I was interviewing you next in the series said, oh, Tad, awesome. Oh, I can't wait to see it. So you're in, this, in the hot seat now. <laughs> Thanks, good to be here. I wanted to begin or introduce this concept of point of view marketing that you've created with the rant experiment. Now, this is something that you ran last year on your blog. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is and what happened? So, yeah, the, this idea of rants, I mean, we've all seen them where people just kind of lose it and say something um, that's not polite um, and yeah, it gets a big response. And <laughs> I noticed that um, I was going back through my website, uh, my blogs, to see which blogs that I posted had gotten the biggest response. And I would have thought, that the ones that gotten the biggest response would have been the most practical ones, the ones that had the most tangible takeaway value. And, you know, I've written those and, and it wasn't them at all. Uh, it was the blog posts that I wrote that were rants. You know, I wrote one called a, why stop playing small as bullshit or um, a few other ones. And I just noticed those ones had the most comments, had the most likes been shared the most. Um, and those are the ones that, yeah, people were saying, oh, I shared that in this coaching group I'm in. Or, you know, those, those were always the ones. It was never the, you know, five steps to get new clients. And so, which was strange, because like, even though that seems like more practical and more useful and that you'd want to share, it's, it doesn't seem to be the case. So, yeah, I just noticed that. And I noticed the appeal that rants uh, seem to have. Um, maybe just because they're so honest, because they reveal a certain point of view, a certain way of seeing things, because they articulate things that other people are feeling, but kind of like the old story of the emperor's new clothes, things that people are very scared to say. Um, and so when somebody says it, and when somebody says it in a way that's even better than we could have articulated it, there's something liberating about that, and freeing, and it gives a certain permission to uh, not you know, go with the masses on something. So, you know, when there's this so much in this uh, industry around, you know, stop playing small and play big and this encouragement to go for more money or bigger sales or bigger seminars and speaking in front of more people, and bigger, 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 um, that there was, I guess, a discomfort that a lot of people shared with me. So when I finally named it and articulated it in the way that I did, there was this huge like ah, relief, like, oh, yeah, that felt uncomfortable for me too. So I think we can all relate to that feeling if you read something, it's like, oh, yes, this, and you share it with everyone they're saying it, you know, the way I want to say it. So yeah, that was it. And how would you, um, what would you say you discovered from the rant experiment? Um, before I answer that, I'm realizing my battery's about to die. I'm just gonna go oh, to the power You better so, get uh, to that. <laughs> I'm actually gonna reframe the question. Uh, with a bit of context because yeah. um, when I read that blog about the rant experiment um, and you included a heap of rants that other people had done and that you'd done um, and I really felt this passion rise inside me like oh, I want to do a rant you know like I want to rant about something this is about over a year ago and um, what something uh, uh, sort of unexpected happened and that was that I couldn't decide what to rant about. And I realized that I had lots of things that I could rant about. And I ended up reaching this kind of point of inertia. And so my question about what did you discover was really about, you know, mm. that aspect of how easy is it for people to actually do a rant in the first place? And what does it take to do to rant? Well, you know, First of all, one of the things I'd say is it's best not to push these things. It's best not to because um, there's a danger of any of these things becoming techniques and becoming tactics that we use to get people to say yes or to, you know, achieve some outcome to get people to do a certain thing to follow us, to like us. 
and as soon as we start doing things with that agenda, um, it's that's where it goes wonky. You know, that's the heart of why so much marketing and selling is manipulative is because it's based on an agenda to get people to do things. So, you know, um, one of the principles that underlies rants is this idea of polarizing. You know, there's a great marketing book called uh, Polarized by Matt Cumming. And he just talks about this dynamic of, of this kind of, uh, how most people in their business, you know, maybe 10% of people who hear about it, they're a solid yes, 10% are a no, and then 80% are like maybe. And so this idea that if you're willing to give a real rant, uh, if you're willing to say controversial things, then people jump off the fence. So maybe now you have 30%, yes, 30% no, 30, you know, 40% maybe, uh, or more. And so that this idea that polarizing is good, but of course then you can hear that and say, aha, so this is the tactic then. I go on rants and I say provocative things and I take um, <laughs> these very controversial stances and that polarizes the response to me. And all my marketing headlines are really controversial and really, pushing buttons, but to me, it's, that's just another kind of manipulating, you know, manipulating people's emotions, and, um, seeming to not give a shit, but actually the whole thing is driven by how big a shit we give of what, how other people see us and what they do. So um. all that to say, this idea of, of doing rants um, and like cracking them out as a tactic to get a response, people feel it. There's a difference between when somebody's just, there's, there's a, the rant I think is defined by just an emotional boiling point where you're just like, I have to fucking say something here. Mm. And, and so you can't manufacture that. It's going to feel contrived. It'll feel maybe a little too polished or they just come out too often. So the thing I'd say is if you've got a number of rants, just, you know, you can create different files on your computer and notes on your phone. And whenever something comes to you about it, you just write it down. So you keep track. So you start to like build, some of these rants where you just starting to notice things. And whenever, you know, something happens that triggers that rant on that, you just write it down and there's going to come a breaking point for you. And you'll just know what it is. It's just going to happen. You'll be like, I have to write this. And then you, all your work doesn't get done for the next three hours while you, because <laughs> yeah. you're just like, I just can't take it. So the, that's to me what defines a rant is you just mm. you boil over. And it's a genuine like, and that's like, I'm not saying this, to get a certain result, I'm just saying this because I'm so sick of it. I'm sick of seeing this. This is the bullshit I see in my industry. This is the bullshit in the world. This is what I'm tired of. Um, and you just have to say it, and you've finally gotten the words for it. Mm. You, know? you know, you finally, because a rant isn't just like, I, I'm just, just that I'm sick of it. But it's like, I'm sick of this, and here's what I'm seeing about it. Yeah. This is the alternate view. To Everyone's saying this, and I want to put out this instead. You know, um, so there's some other sort of proposal in it. It's not a full answer, but it's a perspective shift that you're offering. Of like, instead of why do we have to play big? Why can't small be really beautiful? Or, you know, um, I got really sick of hearing people being like, "Yeah, charge what you're worth. Charge what you deserve." And that was another rant. Was uh, why charging what you deserve is bullshit or something like that. And, <laughs> uh, I'm not tired of it and I was just like you know and so what I was offering was this perspective of the whole problem is that we've tied money to self-worth so this notion of charging what you're worth or charging what you deserve uh, leads people into therapy where they're like oh I'm not charging enough so I guess I must not think I'm worth a lot I'm not you know, speaking up for my value, it's like it's got nothing to do with your value. So that whole framing of it is the problem. And trying to solve the problem within that frame of like pumping yourself up, I'm going to believe it, I'm going to do affirmations to say I'm worth this, that's the problem. Mm. You know, the problem isn't, um, yeah, that we um, don't believe in ourselves, it's that we have tied it to money. Yeah. You know, self-worth is about that. You know, because it, it just falls, to me, it falls apart when you start to look at it. Because are we saying that, like, women in sub-Saharan Africa are worth less than us because they have less money? Or people who charge more, they're worth more than us? And, and then, of course, that opens us up to all the manipulations of going to, you know, seminars. It's like, if you don't want to pay $10,000 and invest that in this, you know, this coaching program or invest that in yourself, then you must not believe in yourself. And that is said directly or indirectly in a lot of different ways, suggesting that 
you get it. You get it. It's just so. Um, but I definitely was like on a lot of these rants and kind of taking notes on it and collecting things. And then a circumstance will happen. I think part of it is the thing is like a rant is a response to something particular. Yeah. A rant is not. Um, it doesn't come out of nowhere. You don't just meditate and a rant appears. Mm. A rant is a, it's a story. It's a response to this happened and this is what came out of it. So even if you've had a lot of the other triggers before, there's eventually going to be a, one, one trigger where you're like, I'm responding to this, but I'm, it's like, I'm not just responding to this one thing. I'm responding to this whole conversation through this. This, this incident is the doorway to, to this much bigger conversation. So the rant is, is that. You're, you're opening a door to like, Here's what's happening. Here's why I see it happening. And here's how I see it could be different. Yeah. Yes. And that's what I love about the rant is that it actually prompts people to, to choose a point of view in that moment. It's not something they have to be wedded to. Um, and that's, I feel is so, where a lot of the power of point of view marketing that you've created comes from is actually taking a stance rather than just blending in, um, and as you say, trying to serve everyone and please everyone with your marketing message. So how do the rant, does the rant and point of view marketing relate from your perspective? Well, so when we're talking about point of view, we're talking about one of two things. So if you're a service provider, we're specifically talking about, you know, somebody's got a problem and they want a result. And it's like, uh, you know, my colleague, Bill Barron had the metaphor of how if you're on, if you have, it's like, you're on island A where you've got some problem and you want to be on island B where there's some result. And our business is like a boat that can take them from one island to the other. And so if you're a service-based business, that business is going to be based largely on that journey. So identifying what's the problem somebody has and what's the result they want and helping them on that journey. So then your point of view becomes the point of view of how they make the journey from island A to island B. If you're a product-based business, you're selling the boat itself. And then you have a certain perspective and opinion about how the boats get constructed and made and what the best design is, you know, um, et cetera. So there's some kind of style uh, and aesthetic that shows up uh, in that. And so, so that's what point of view is. So rant is just saying, being willing to say you have an opinion about that journey or an opinion about how boats are made. Um, and that you're seeing a lot of shoddy stuff. You know, my friend Randall, who lives just a block from me, does a, he's got a business thing, it's called Gridworks, but he does solar power. And he's ranted to me a few times about, like most of his jobs installing solar panels are actually fixing poor installations by people who were not certified journeyman electricians. So stuff catches fire, they just oh. are not, you know, they get the idea of solar power, some of the, the but they don't understand uh, the whole world of being an electrician, <laughs> all the subtleties of that. So he's gone on those rants. Um, so he's got a rant about the craft itself. Um, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so that's what point of view is. And so the rant is just you get to a point where it's like, I'm tired of people saying, this is the way to get to this island, or this is the way you build boats. Or, you know, you, you get sick of it and you want to say something. Mm. And so, like, what does it really take? What sort of experience or personal attributes does it take to have a point of view in your marketing? Oh man, I wouldn't even begin to <laughs> have an opinion about that. <laughs> I don't know. You know, I mean, cause I guess it's like, I get where the question's going and it could be, well, you've got to be courageous and vulnerable and you've got to, you know, all of that. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's the best direction to go. Um, a better question might be, what is it that stops us from doing rants in the first place or speaking our mind and sharing our opinion? And um, what are the consequences to us and others of being willing to share it, uh, of being willing to take that step, <coughs> even if we don't feel ready? Um, to me, those two questions might be more uh, useful. And so the first one, I think it's just good to look at. It's like, yeah, why are we so scared to say what we feel is true? And there's a lot of fear of rejection about that. And like, so it's good to look at that. That's, I mean, yeah, this is where therapists and coaches and folks <laughs> like yourself you know, around particular things can come in very handy of like, why can't I say it? You know, mm -hmm. I can think it and then at the moment I shut down. So what is it? 
you know, what's the what's the meaning I've attached to it, all that kind of inner work gets really useful. And, and I suppose it's, it's going to be different for everybody. <clears throat> um, I'm reticent to give any kind of panacea answer because where you get stuck is probably going to be very different from where I get stuck. Um, and so the, I think the response has got to be different. Mm. But there is something. So I think noticing that reactive part of us that either collapses or, or postures or, you know, um, it's good. Um, and then what does it do to us? And it's interesting because all these qualities that we think, oh, I need to have this in order to do a rant are the things that show up for you as you do it. In the process of doing it, you're being courageous. In the process of doing it, you're, um, <coughs> the vulnerability is there. It's like you don't, vulnerability is not required to do a rant. Courage is not required to do a rant. Courage is the, the result of the rant. You know, when you do something that scares you afterwards, you're like, fucking hell, it's like amazing. You know, you <laughs> this library and says, like, I can't believe I did that. Mm. So sometimes we do the thing first, and then those qualities we think that we needed to have, then they show up. It's like, yeah, I don't know. You're going to walk around the world just feeling courageous all the time, but it's never tested. And we're just supposed to pretend, and that maybe there's a certain value in that, but it's, it's more than that. Yeah, like what happens when I don't collapse in the face of something? What happens when I say the truth when it's scary? Yeah. Um, you know, and of course that's everything from business to it, more intimate relationships to friendships. You know, you've had something chip on your shoulder. You want to say it, still want to hurt their feelings. And finally you say it and the world doesn't fall apart. You know, maybe they yeah. get angry. But eventually you get over it <laughs> or you lose them as a friend. You're like, wow, they were not that good a friend. But it's like, oh, I'm still okay. But sometimes we don't believe we're going to be okay because we've never tested. We've never tried a damn thing. We've never really put out our opinion because we're so scared of what the reaction is going to be. And the truth is some people will be, will be pissed. Some people won't like it. The more we're willing to be ourselves, the more it's going to polarize. And so again, this isn't a tactic. This isn't a, and so therefore you do this to get a polarized response. It's just saying that if you're willing to be real, you will get a more polarized response. Some people are going to like it. Some people are not going to like it. Um, and that's how it is. Yeah. And so if you, um, if we break down point of view into the three elements, the map, the compass and the route or the route, um, yeah. what, how would you do a nutshell explanation of those and how they fit together? Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so using that metaphor of the islands, you know, and so of course these are just metaphors. So, Somebody else might explain this or understand it in a different way. Um, yeah, they're just to try to point in a certain direction. But the map is this idea of like, yeah, if you're going to go from one island to the other, it's probably good to have a map. And the map is a, just a, a description of the territory. A map is not a, a prescription. It's just a description. It's just saying this is how it is, you know, so we can think of the seven chakras, the Chinese meridian system, the medicine wheels and different cultures are all an attempt to map something that's true. They're not the territory, but they're trying to give some approximation or some hints of what the territory might be. There's some sort of a, um, yeah, you, can, you know, it's like a map of a city. Of course, that map is not the city, but it gives you a sense of where you are and where you want to be. And it gives you the capacity to move a lot more easily because you know what's happening, what's so. Um, and then the, the compass is this idea of just your core principles or assumptions or premises that your work is based on. So yeah, if you're going to do a big trip, um, it's important to have a compass to even know it's hard to use a map if you can't even orient to it, you know, what direction is north. And, and especially, you know, maps are fine and dandy, but once you actually get in the territory, it's easy to get lost because there are certain things that are not on the map. There's always going to be unexpected things, but compass is kind of least keep us going in the right direction until we maybe we see something familiar again. So yeah, it's our values, it's our principles, it's the, the big ideas that guide our work. Um, so, you know, for me, one of the core principles would be this idea that uh, marketing can feel good, that it doesn't feel good because we have this agenda to get people to do things and to say yes and to buy from us. That would be a core premise. And some of my colleagues um, would disagree with that or don't. <coughs> um, that hasn't occurred to them. You know, like um, one of the premises, so yeah, I think there are premises, you know, that are different premises will lead to different outcomes. So twice, and it's funny, in two days in Toronto, I had people say, 
but don't you think that you've got to, you know, people are so indecisive. You've got to, basically what they were getting is you've got to use some of these techniques. You've got to apply a bit of pressure to get people to decide because otherwise they won't. It's like, yeah, yeah. So that's the, that's the idea is that people are indecisive. So they're not going to take care of themselves. So we need to step in and make the decision for them because that we know what's best for them better than they do. But it's like when you come across something you really love and you want, are you indecisive? No, you're like, I mean, maybe you're scared, but you're not, it's not a, you know what you want when you really want something. Um, so it's like, can we take the pressure away? Can we lower the risk and make it easier and sweeter and a gentler process for people to work with us? Yeah. But this idea of like, I need to hijack your decision-making thing and make the decision for you basically, use all these pressure tactics. Um, that has a lot of unintended consequences. So, you know, there's some, so there's two different points of view. There's the point of view, kids won't learn unless you bribe them, unless you give them gold stars and punish them. And, and, you know, versus an assumption that it's like, oh, kids just naturally learn all the time and you can't stop them. It's just always happening constantly. You know, the, the assumption learning only comes from school and from teachers in the school, from a curriculum sanctioned by the old white man in the nation state. There's a certain thing that flows out of that versus like, no, kids are always learning and learning is an inherent part of life. Um, yeah, I think you understand. So, um, so that's the compass. And then the route is, um, this is the practical, this is the prescription, not a description. This is like on a pyramid. So I, I didn't actually, I don't know if this was in copy the, was the whole point of your pyramid in the ebook you read? Yep. Yep. Yeah. So this idea that it's like, foundationally we've got the territory on top of that is the pyramid so the the territory is actually the main thing and everything in this pyramid is kind of in service to the territory so the foundation is the map that's the first thing on top of that we have the route but then the capstone on it uh you know which uh it's called the pyramidion uh, on pyramids you know used to be it was very ornate you know gold design and so i could just imagine some ambassador coming over the hill one day and seeing the sun glint off and it'd be a very impressive thing so of course this route is like your protocol your plan your um your seven steps to from a to b your formula uh, all of that and it's um it's the shiny of course it's the thing that everybody wants it's like oh i just need my proven formula that's gonna help me sell yeah. things better um so it's the shiniest, but it rests on the rest of those things. You know, no territory, no process. Mm. Uh, so, you know, and a territory means it's a particular place. That pyramid's in a place and time. Uh, and so, and it, if that pyramid were in a different place and different time, probably a different design on that capstone. You know, it's not like, it's not like there was a Walmart in Egypt, I imagine, for like, where do you want your capstone? They have like four to choose from. <laughs> I imagine, I don't know anything about them, but I would suspect that they told a particular story, that those designs said something about that time and that place, not <coughs> picked off the shelf. Um, and so similarly, our the routes that we have have to be faithful to a particular territory. Um, you know, so it's a route from like this place to that place, you know, from this particular problem to that solution. Mm. Not just like, yeah, I help people who are like struggling with some problems, get them some results. It's not, that doesn't work. It's no good. It's not trustworthy. Nobody buys that. That's what sounds like hype in the marketplaces. This can solve everything. But it's like, yeah, you just are, you're, you're a man who's struggling with, do I stay in the relationship or do I go? That's the problem. And Island mm. B, you've made a decision um, <clears throat> and you feel in integrity with that decision, regardless of kind of the outcome, but you feel solid powerful in yourself as a man for having me, you know, that's a very particular journey, mm. especially if we frame it as like in North America and that, that specific context. Now you can come up with a route for that journey. That's going to make a lot of sense, you know, helping North American men. Just, you know. So, so it's those three. And, um, it, it seems to be easiest to start with the route. Ironically, that seems to be the easiest place to begin because it's the most tangible. And then you can kind of work backwards to like, well, why these steps in this order, because we tend to have something anyways. Yeah. What are the premises that's based on and what's the overall map? And, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love it. There's so much in point of view with these three elements coming together. What, in your experience, which element is typically missing or the most challenging for people to um, portray? All of them, uh, for a lot of people, frankly. 
but the map is the hardest one to get across in my mind. The map is the one that's like, because the map is not the route, it's different. The route is usually pretty easy for people to sit down and if they've got even some semblance of a niche, some semblance of like what they're up to, mm. then it's, it's not so hard to come up with something. I'm like, yeah, what do I do? What are my best thoughts about this? You know, because the route isn't a guarantee. It's just saying, uh, this is your best fighting chance mm. in the journey. No promises, but if I had to lay my money down, something that was going to be the most certain, this is what it is. So most people can come up with that. The principles most people can come up with, but the, the map is just a whole other beast. It's like, man, that to seven chakras, that wasn't like come up with, I don't think, by one generation of people. Yeah. You know, that was probably many generations of a lot of observation of like, how does the world actually work? Mm. What are the different parts of it? Uh, you know, so we're looking at the body, trying to map out the body, um, you know, and the whole medicine wheel. It's an attempt to map out the, the whole world, this cosmology of a particular place, which is why you go to different places. The medicine wheel looks different. Yep. Because the seasons are different, and that's what it's mapping out. And the, the days are different, you know. I was just in Iceland, and it's just like, you, like a month ago, and it's like 24-hour sunlight. Mm. So, I mean, people haven't been there, I don't even think, long enough to make it. They've only been there like a thousand, a thousand years. But if they were going to make one, you just have a whole different thing than, you know, uh, in, at the equator. Yeah. And so uh, are you up for doing a real life uh, challenge of a map on this call yeah. right now of a map I've thrown together before <laughs> this week? Yeah. Yeah. See what you think and uh, let's dissect what the map really is. I'm just going to share my screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'll just give you some context and you can then pick it to pieces. Um, so what I was putting together here was basically on this, on the topic of sacred money. Um, mm -hmm. what are the options that people have to create a livelihood? Um, out there, this is based on my experience of the landscape of creating a business and going, Yep, I have that option and that option and that option and that option, but still none of them feel quite right for me. So this is my lay of the land. Um, so what I've noticed over the years is that people tend to fall into one of these camps when it comes to creating a business. And this is based on what they tend to prioritize. So people will either prioritize um, nature, um, They'll prioritize spirituality, they'll prioritize like accumulating possessions or they'll prior and or they'll prioritize like basically just growth, capitalist growth. Um, then I also witnessed the combinations when you put two camps together. So you put spirituality with capitalism, you get hearts into business or social enterprise. Then you put eco and green business together and you get you know, like this is the nature combined with money. Um, then there's the law of attraction folks. <laughs> My spirituality meets materialism and unlimited possibilities of what I can attract and create abundance with. Um, then you get the um, materialist combined with the capitalist. <laughs> That's a little controversial there, but we all know about the one percenters. And then you put spiritualists with naturists and they do, naturists and they just want to live off the grid. And that's their take on livelihood. So this is my map of what I saw um, was out there as, as options. There's nothing, there's nothing for naturism and materialism together? Um, I actually don't think so. Not that I've witnessed because they tend to be, um, they don't tend to work together nicely. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I can tell, because nature, of course, is not about exponential growth and accumulation, but materialism is very much about that. But I could be wrong, so. Well, you know, I mean, it strikes me with that you have the, uh, there is a certain crowd that, like, shops at Guyam all the time. 
And it's still big houses, but they're eco-friendly houses. Oh, yeah. You know, there are these kind of people who are into like, yeah, everything they, they like bamboo clothing shipped from around the world or like, um, I've definitely seen a kind of rich green thing where. Oh. Uh, okay. So that's not, that's not foreign to me in this. So, okay, that well, let me just pause here and say, this is really brilliant. This is really good. And I'll, I'll tell you why I think so is because when you show a map to people, you should be getting the kind of response that I was giving, which is just this nodding. I'm like, yeah, that's true. I've seen that too, right? The map has to represent something real in people's lives that they can relate to. It's not just some abstract bullshit map you pull out of nowhere, your theories, because this is where people get into trouble with, with uh, niching, which relates to this, is um, two places people get in trouble. One is they do a bunch of stuff and they never reflect on it. They never think about it. So they have all this experience uh, that they've never kind of sorted out or thought about or reflected on. But the other place people go wrong is they just go in their head and they just think about what is my role? What was my role? What is my work? And it's all internal. They've never tried a damn thing in the world. They've never talked to anybody. And so then when people finally design a business based on that, it's terrible because it's, it's, there were no conversations that fostered it. Mm. So they come up with these very ungrounded, you know, like, man, and you've probably seen some of these or heard some of these ideas. People come up like, we're going to do this thing that's going to unite everybody and it's going to be sustainable for everybody. And, da, da, da. and I'm just like, I sat at a party in Toronto and a friend of mine invited this lady. Who, and I was just like, it was one of these people at the party. I was just like, I trusted my friend less because she'd invited her. Um, but she just had this whole thing about, yeah, we're going to do this new business and it's just going to change everything. And I was like, and my friend Russell got really excited. He said, oh, wow, that sounds really exciting. I was like, Russell, stay the fuck away from her. Or, it's like, or better yet, go talk to her and figure out what there is there. Because I promise you, there's nothing there. There's no there there when you talk to her. And come back and tell me how confused you are. <laughs> and he came back and he was just like, I have no idea. What the hell? <laughs> you know? It was just, there was nothing real. It was so when people have a real map, it's based on something actual, it's based on experiences, it's based on a particular territory that people look at and be like, oh yeah, I've been there, I've seen that, yeah, I've been at that place. Mm -hmm. So this is really brilliant, because as you're going through, it's like, yeah, those four, I certainly understand all four of those, I've seen all four of those. And it's interesting because this is, if we took this to, I don't know, Southern Alabama, this would not be familiar to them. <laughs> you're right. You know, just, so I'm just thinking out of the, you know, like some redneck community in the hills. They're just like, they're going to make, they're not actually going to probably recognize much of this. <laughs> yeah. I took this to uh, Marin County in California or San Francisco, where I took it to some yoga conference. Everyone would be like, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm. Everyone would get it. So, this is mapping out, not the whole world. This is important. She, you know, uh, we're not trying to map out everything. Well, what we are saying is there's a particular series of communities that seem to interact with each other. There's certain, these four communities and the relationships with each other. That's what's being mapped out. There's plenty of communities that are not on here. Mm. You know, I don't see the anti-racist <coughs> community on here. I don't see the, um, the anarchist crowd on here. I don't see uh, the white supremacists on here, and I don't see the the artsy crowd in Berlin on. You know what I'm saying? It's like there's a lot that's yeah. not here. That's important, and it's okay. It's good. The map doesn't have to be every damn thing. Mm. Although, you know, a next step on this might be like, how does this fit into even a bigger picture of the world? And you know, you can do kind of stack the, your cosmologies. You know, yeah. until it sort of is universal. You can do that. But that's really good. So I'm hearing it and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I know those things. And when she starts drawing those connections, you heard me say, yeah, oh, oh, yeah, uh huh. I've seen all of those. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm totally, of course, I'm familiar with all these different crowds and I've never seen it laid out in this way. Um, so a map is like something that is like, a, it makes it easier. It makes sense of things. It's saying, here's some patterns you may have seen laid out in a really clear framework. Like, it makes me think of my friend Ben Jones, who uh, is in the States, he's uh, uh, kind of a public commentator on a lot of important issues. But he did this presentation about, he's a, he's a black guy. And he's like, this is the presentation that Al Gore would have done if he was black. But he had this um, a, a, a quadrant of um, green to gray as a map, which makes me think I should add this in the next edition of the book. I'm actually just done. 
remind me. Um, but so it was this idea that you know you've got um, things that are low, that are not very green, and they're very gray as solutions. So this is all the pollution, and then you've got things that are uh, how do I go green, but not gray. And it was like uh, green and not gray was like yeah polar bears, you know, um, and then green and gray was the pollution stacks. Uh, you should, anyways, go to YouTube. Uh, yeah. you ban <laughs> green to gray. I think it's a killer presentation, but it was a map. It was saying like, look, yeah. there are four of ways ahead, and the way we want to go ahead is is this. So it um, well, it just gives what the options are. It actually didn't prescribe anything per se, which is important. So this map here, it's a description. It's not a prescription. Mm. Nowhere in this map am I hearing her say, and then this is what we should do. This is the answer. It's just kind of saying, like, isn't this how it is? Yeah, it's mm. kind of like this. Mm. Um, you know, it's it, like somebody asked, somebody asked the uh, teacher, Sogol Rinpoche, they were like, why is it that uh, everything, or he said, like, you know, people always ask me, they say, Sogol, they say, why is it everything always changing? Mm. Why is it everything, nothing ever stays the same? Why is it, you know, you step in a river, you can't step in the same place, and why, why are everything shifting all the time? And I say, the reason everything always changing is because uh, it's like that. <laughs> <laughs> so what he's saying is like, yeah, this map, this thing you're experiencing of <clears throat> things always changing, it's true. And the only appropriate answer is like, amen, that's how it is. So mm -hmm. a map has to withstand scrutiny. So which is why I was like, well, what about this connection? You know, is mm -hmm. there something there and we have to find something? A map is something that um, you just keep testing it against the territory because this is representing something. This isn't anything itself. Mm. You know, it's just a, a screen. It's a piece of paper. Um, but it's got to be useful. It's got to be when people actually are in the trenches, in the territory, can they uh, find their way around using this thing? So I would say so far from what I've seen, I love it. I think this is just, you nailed it. Awesome. I'm great. I'm so glad that we have an example of a map because it's something that out of the three elements, compass, map, and route, um, that I was missing uh, yeah. in my marketing. It's something that has been floating around in my brain for a long time, but I never thought, I never gave it the importance until I read your work on point of view. So I'm curious to know, like, what happens when the map is missing in someone's marketing, in your experience? Uh, You know, I've seen that people get by without point of view, first of all. There's certain people who, like, they've never sat down and actually articulated a point of view, and they still seem to do fine. So if this isn't a, like, if you don't buy my book on point of view or you know, take the course, <laughs> forever, people seem to do okay. But yep. um, I do notice there's a, the, there's a credibility piece here where people, so people come to us, either really wanting the type of product that we sell and wanting to trust that it's good quality, or they come to us wanting to go on a particular journey and wanting to trust that we can take them there. And so, yeah, I wouldn't make it so black and white of like, you know, it's just, it's not a disaster, but it's, it's so comforting. It brings so much safety and trust oh. into the interaction when I know that somebody knows what the hell they're talking about. Oh. Like I've been having some issues with my feet um, I just have really narrow feet and high arches and on the outside, like a little more of a bone protrusion than maybe other people have. So it's just meant that my feet, like the last two were, I was like, man, my feet are so sore and like stiffness in my calves and da, da, da. And so then I go to, uh, I just went to a foot doctor today and it was like so beautiful because he's just like, yeah, so here's what's happening. And he had the chart of the feet, you know, the bones and the muscles. That's a map. Mm. You know, we're not saying he's got real feet on the wall or yeah. that's my foot. I'm just saying this represents what's happening here. And of course, extremely well. And he's like, so here's what's happening. It's like, because your feet are so narrow, because you've got these high arches, that means like you think, you know, there's this muscle on the bottom of your foot that kind of goes right into your calf. So if your calf is tight, it's tight. You know? And it was just like, he was making sense of my experience. And when somebody does that, we just trust them more. Uh, 2008, I had my gallbladder out, you know, which I wrote about in the book, but it's like, Nobody I came across had a map for what the hell was going on. It's like, yeah, you got these stones, 
But nobody was like, <clears throat> so here's how gallstones form in the body. This is the mechanism. And therefore, if you want to reverse it, this is what you need to do. You know, so here's the protocol. But the protocol is based on this understanding of what's actually happening in your body. And in the compass would be like, here are our premises, because we don't know for sure. But here's the premises. I wanted that so badly. Mm. And when people don't, part of the consequence, let's flip it. Not what, what's the consequence for us as an entrepreneur when we don't have a map? What's the consequence for the person with a problem when they don't have a map? They feel fucking helpless. Yeah. Because if, if you have a problem that is like mm. uh, breaking your heart and you don't know how to get out of it, it's so uh, despair inducing, you know, yeah. no, no hope. It's like, oh my God, I'm just, I'm trapped here. So with the gallbladder, you know, I just had surgery to have it out eventually because it was getting so bad and I didn't want that. But if somebody sat me down and been able to show me a map and a compass and give me a protocol, you know, in the beginning, I just like, out of the urgency, I want to save this organ. I just spent so much money, Chinese bitters and chaka piedra and acupuncture and stretching and visualization, every damn thing. But there is a point you just give up. Because, you know, I went for the ultrasounds, nothing had changed. So it was like, nothing I'm doing seems to have any impact. So you do just, of course you give up. You know, you'd almost be a yeah. fool not to sort of stop trying because <clears throat> why would you keep doing something if nothing's, no results? But if somebody had given me that map, I would have spent thousands of dollars. Mm. I would have redone all my efforts because I would have had some sense of direction and a, a route that I could trust because it wasn't just the, Capstone to the pyramid. I'm swearing a lot today. It's not, it wouldn't just be the capstone of the pyramid sitting in the in the desert by itself. Yeah. It's got something holding it up that's solid, um, mm. you know. Or not just a capstone on a big pole up there that's waving around that could be broken or blown down at any second. It's like that's not going to move because it's based on something real solid. Um, so it's people weep when they come across somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about, like let's just say you get the, the dreaded diagnosis, the C word, mm. and it devastates you and you are just, and then you sit, have to sit down with somebody and they say, and this is a point, point of view is not guarantees. Point of view doesn't mean definitely. Mm. Point of view just means best fighting chance. Point of view just means here's how it is. No guarantee we get out of this jungle alive, but here's the best way I know at this mm. point. Yeah, but if you get that diagnosis and somebody sits you down and is like, look, okay, this particular kind of cancer you have has this kind of recovery rate. Um, and here's what's happening in your body that's creating it. This is our map. So we're not saying it's true, but this is our understanding of what's happening. Um, <clears throat> certain principles we have you know, around what creates those things in the body. And so based on that, here's our best approach you just break down crying because you're like, there's something that I can do now. Mm. So it's, like, it's such a, a gift when somebody has a clear point. You know, one of my friends um, was running and he, his foot got caught in a gopher hole and he hyperextended his knee. Like, Grr! And he had crawled home two miles. It was in agony. And he went to one osteopath and they had a pretty good map. Um, but they were like, maybe surgery. Da, da, da. So then he went to another place, which was this place called the uh, Soros Clinic in California, which is where a lot of the NBA basketball players go. And the guy walked in with the MRI of his knee. And he's like, so, okay, it looks like you were, um, I'm going to guess you were running uh, and you got your foot caught in something and you, your knee hyper, and he was just like laying out what had happened just from looking at the, the MRI. And he said, like, so here's what happened in your body. You know, this has happened that impacts these things. Some people recommend surgery, but you can avoid that with this and this. We just have to strengthen these muscles and rest this and stretch it. Blah, blah, blah. And my friend John was just sitting there just like, blah, like, who are you showing me a way out of this forest that I thought I might be trapped in forever? So the relief that it gives when somebody, mm. and how, like, imagine then you sit down with somebody, you get the, the diagnosis of cancer, and somebody's just like, yeah, so, I mean, oh, no, cancer's an opportunity, you know? Because it's all just love or fear. And so that's what you have to decide is like, are you going to be in a place of love or fear? And you're like, that's your map. That's it. That's the whole thing. <laughs> or they're just like, you know, it's just alkaline. You just kind of alkalize your body. That's it. So, you know, 
almonds and lemon in your water, and that'll handle it. <laughs> it's, not, it's not just that you don't trust it. There's an act of like, fuck you. Yeah. Like, how dare you walk into this territory where I'm living, in this jungle that I've tried to get out of dozens of times, or that I'm terrified I'm not going to get out of, and you come in here and you just tell me it's easy? Mm. Like, screw you. It's, if anyone's ever had that kind of pat advice, like, oh, I think my husband might be cheating on me. It's like, you just have to trust. You just have to love. And you just want to shake people. <laughs> you know, it's like, you've never been here, have you? That's you don't right. know what this territory is like. So oh. get out of here. Yeah, so... I love it. So people, the tendency is for people to go straight to the root and they bypass the opportunity for creating safety in their marketing, which is invaluable. That's what you've just highlighted to me. True. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's more trustworthy when, when it's like, I mean, yeah, share your route. You're like, here's my general sense of how things go. But here's what it's based on. Yep. You know, and you share stories of like, yeah, I was in this territory myself one time and here's how I got out. And then I started talking to other people who were in this territory. We shared stories and we started to realize, yeah, there's this whole, you know, little cave that you can follow that takes you, etc. Which is what, you know, you read stories about, um, I mean, what is mythology except incredibly elaborate, ornate maps mm. of what it is to be human in this world? You know, the, <clears throat> I was just reading Iron John by Robert Bly and he said, it's talking about how, you know, human babies, they, um, we come out of the womb not quite ready. Like every other animal comes out of the womb because they stay, they gestate a little bit longer. And so they've got all these instincts. Like how the hell does a bird know how to bird build a nest? Maybe never even seen it done. How does a turtle come out of its egg and just go into the ocean and know what to do? Human could never do that. Human come out of the womb and left there, dies. Mm. Period. So his thing was, he said, you know, so for humans, our instincts and our intuition are stored in our stories and our mythology. That's where they live. And that's why it's so important to take care of them. So it's a map in a way, this kind of mythology. And, and uh, so, yeah, you know, when, when we sense that somebody, you go to a therapist, if all they have is like, well, yeah, there's this theory, you know, these seven steps that we take people through, but then you start pushing it. Because again, it's like, it's like the, uh, I've never said it like this, but you know, it's like that period, that capstone on a stick. You go, yeah, but you push it and it wobbles a little bit and you push it more and then it falls over. Like just last week, I had a, got a text from an acquaintance of mine. <laughs> He's like, I'm at the hospital. I'm suicidal. I'm trying to get admitted. And they didn't admit him and we had to pull together, you know, I messaged a bunch of mutual Facebook friends and who wants to be on the care team and rallied together and ended up sitting down with him that night with a friend of mine, uh, Ross Goodine, who specializes in uh, suicide. If anyone knows somebody struggling with it, there's a website, preventingsuicide.ca. This fellow Ross is brilliant at helping people figure out the um, why. But he's got his own map about suicide. And like, he's like, you know, there are kind of five main reasons that people have this urge to leave this life. So we sat down, we talked about it. But, you know, he, he'd gone to therapy. It wasn't like he'd never gone. He'd gone to plenty of it. He'd gone to five month things. He said, but so much of it, so much of it just seemed like bullshit. Meaning it was like he pushed on it and it collapsed. Mm. You know, so it'd, be like, it'd be like that capstone on one stick or maybe a few, but you start to push it. And you're like, how solid is this thing? Yeah. And then it breaks and it all falls. And so, I'm, so I just was hearing in what he was saying, <clears throat> he hadn't come across a solid anything that was based on something he could really trust. And so then people, it's like, a, it's like that, the, the dynamic of gaslighting, you know, where it's like uh, the abusive tactic of like, the, often the man would like turn the heat down in the place. And then often the woman in the relationship would say like, oh, it's so cold here. He said, no, it's not cold, same temperature. And they start to question themselves, mm. you know? Um, so the same thing where it's like, no, this technique works. And say, like, well, it's not working for me. I, I pushed on it. You know, I heard the theory and I wanted to try and so I pushed on, but it kind of collapsed and it fell and it made this big flip. And then they're like, no, 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 no. Well, you just didn't do it right. Because it's, it's very solid. Yeah. So it's, it's this abusive thing where people are like, but it doesn't seem to work for me. It doesn't actually seem that solid in reality. It didn't seem to be based on much. Um, and then we get told we're wrong versus it's like you try it and it's like, oh, that worked. Which is why I think, you know, certain things like um, nonviolent communication, the work of Byron Katie, the Pasana meditation, 
um, at least in my experience, very solid. Mm. It's like the, the harder you push it, the firmer it becomes. Because it's based on something real. So, it, or, you know, another way you could say is like you build this pyramid, but you build it on a, a, a hole or something, you know? <laughs> yeah. you some sticks holding it up. But if you put any more weight on this thing, it's, God, it all falls through. Because it's not, not built on anything real. Um, it's this theory, you know, I was talking with a Hawaiian shaman years ago, 10 years ago. He was talking about, he said, you know, things have their kind of negative and positive polarities. And it's like, with knowledge, the shadow side of knowledge isn't ignorance. It's theory. Mm. Theory not based on anything real. When you push on it, it just collapses. So point of view, there's a, there's a real responsibility here if we're going to help somebody to have something solid that they can count on, that they can depend on. And so that, you know, <clears throat> the, um, there was a woman who came to one of my marketing workshops in Vancouver a couple years ago. And she came very steeped in a lot of this marketing rhetoric of, um, you know, the, the pressure stuff. I think she was in multi-level mar multi marketing. And so she, all the high pressure tactics and everything that I learned when I was like 18, 19, 20. And I drank the Kool-Aid on fully. And I did everything she was talking about. I was like, yeah, I remember that. And so she came to me desperate because here she is so she's on island a and her particular island a is i'm here i'm a single woman in north america i'm scared that i may become a bag lady that i may fall through the cracks of this and eventually but i found something a boat that i think could, but the boat seems to have some some leaks in it but i have found something and but I'm a little scared and I, and I don't feel good about this boat because maybe it was harvested unethically, et cetera. It's like, so she comes to me, she's like, you say you got a better boat, <clears throat> prove it. And it was like sword fighting. It was like, she pulled out her sword and she came at me and she was like, you need to know that your fighting technique is superior to mine because it's got to work in the real world. I've got bills to pay. I've got kids to feed. I've got real actual responsibilities. So if you're just coming at me with this bullshit about, Oh, just don't apply pressure and trust that it's all going to work out. Uh, I can't have that. So it wasn't angry. It wasn't aggressive, but it was, um, <clears throat> it was real. So she mm. came in, but what about this? You know, with this move. And I was just like, yeah, I remember that move. And, you know, <laughs> she would, I would disarm her and like the sword would fly out. And she'd kind of be astonished that I'd beaten that move. And that she scrambled, she grabbed her sword and be like, ah, what about this? And she, so she kept coming at me, and I'd be like, yes, right, that. but then if you do that, here's the unintended consequence, that actually bites you in the ass, like, Shoo, and, she's like, no. and eventually, she had no more moves at the end of it. Yeah, she had, like, another way to look at this is, um, so a statue, I don't think this is actually in the book, it's a new thought I've had, but it's like, a statue, you push it, and it can fall over. It's, it doesn't have a lot of response, yeah? A human body, you push it, and it's it's um, adaptable. It's flexible. It can, can kind of move with it. And so when we're developing a point of view, we tend to go through these three stages of it's like simplistic, that gets really complicated, then it's simple at the end. And so the simplistic is like the statue. It's so easy. It's just love versus fear. We get so stoked. And, and when we start off, we start to learn these things, these basic ideas, and they're so new to us. And we get so excited which is important because the excitement is what carries us through stage two where it all falls to hell. You know, because we see a statue. <laughs> and it's like, it's a perfect statue of the human body. You know, and then we're like, I'm going to do that. I'm going to build that. Oh, I'm so inspired. Sometimes like, great, I'll give you the starter kit. Here's a bag of bones. These are all the bones in a human body. And we sit there being like, what goes where? I really don't. Is this an arm bone or a leg bone? <laughs> and is this for the fingers or toes? Could be a toe. Maybe it's a Maybe it's a thumb. Maybe it's a, you know, you don't know. And so it's like you're trying to fit it. It's just, it's terrible. It's the worst. It's when all of our fancy ideas uh, meet the actual world. And we have to now put it together. But then eventually we get to a point where, you know, okay, it's, I just imagine like somebody trying to, you know, some, the first God, like, building your body, just like, man, this is a tricky stuff. You know, you got this ligament here and this muscle. Oh, wait, wait, switch that, you know. But eventually you get a functional you know, you breathe life into a functional human body that works. That seems very simple. It seems like, Oh, not such a complicated thing, this human body, but it's enormously complicated. It's enormously um, articulated in all the joints that it has. And um, 
so it takes time to get there. It takes, it takes some time um, to have somebody that can respond to the real world. Because if that woman had come at me, <clears throat> and I was like, I just kept repeating the same thing of like, no, 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 no pressure. No, nope. like I said, no pressure. That doesn't work. And she's like, yeah, but, I, but then they're not going to buy. Well, no pressure, you know. Mm. Uh, she would have left, um, I imagine, angry mm. and sort of betrayed. Because here I am coming and saying I got something to say. And then when the real world shows up, it collapses immediately. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it just falls over. She pushed it and then boom. Oh, I love so, it. It's, oh, it just, you've just basically highlighted the brilliance to me about point of view marketing because um, it's actually about integrity in your offers in your offerings, making sure they are rock solid, making sure there's real guts, meat, constitution to what you're offering and that you're not taking shortcuts, which right. then eventually breaks down and, you know, um, in the people that you're serving or in the relationships of those transactions. And so yeah. it's just like, it's absolute gold, the potential of point of view. And it extends way beyond marketing, in my opinion, that, you know, in, in its application, I love yeah. it. I'm, I'm, I just think it's brilliant, Tad. Yeah. And it's just, I also feel like, you know, we're just scratching the surface of it too. There's just, you know, we could talk for hours. That's, on how, it. It should be. That's how it should be. Um, it's a good thing to notice. You should be able to sit down with one of your potential clients and talk for <laughs> an hour about this and then be like, I feel like I'm just scratching the surface with you. Mm. This seems like just the tip of the iceberg. It's like, yeah, because it is. Mm. It should be that. It shouldn't be like at the end of an hour, you're starting to recycle everything. Yeah. If you know, if you know something, then it's like <clears throat> you really, because this is what this is asking is that you know a particular piece of land, a particular mm -hmm. terrain, a particular issue in a way that is so much deeper than they know it. Mm. It's like how disappointing for me with the gallbladder thing to come to people and then be like alkalize and this, that, and there was a certain point, I mean, most of us have had this experience, you're going through a certain thing, you start researching it on the internet and you learn about it. And then you come to a doctor and you know more than the doctor does. Mm. That's discouraging as hell. Mm. You're like, but what about this study? Never heard about that study. It's like, but then, what about this mechanism in the body? Well, really? No, I don't think that's true. You know, and you're just like, oh my God, how do I know more than you? Like, you should know more than them. If you're going to be taking them on a journey, you're like, yeah, let's go from this part and go through the jungle and over here. You better know more than them. Mm. That is your responsibility to know more than them about that place. Yeah. You know, not, you don't always have to know a lot more. You don't have to be miles ahead. Um, but then if you're not going to be, you know, because that lifts up this question, am I ready and all this. As long as you're not over promising, you're fine. Mm. As long as you're saying, look, I've only done this once or twice, but it's more than you. So I can't promise anything, but here's the experience I have. And if that is appealing, you want to pay me, great. As long as that's clear, you're fine. Mm. Um, but there's, of course, these temptations in marketing to want to posture and want to puff up and want to demonstrate ourselves an, as an expert <coughs> and to overpromise, um, which has devastating consequences for us because the word of mouth becomes shitty. They ask for refunds and they tell all their friends that we didn't really do the job. Number two, devastating consequences for them because they got their hopes up again. Maybe now they're not going to try, even though the next time it might work. Because now their trust is lower. And it devastates the marketplace because now we just sort of know, oh, yeah, people lie in their marketing and people are, you know. Um, and so nobody trusts anybody in the marketplace. Yeah. yeah. And so if we link this back to yeah. um, what you were saying earlier about people not, you know, trying to value what they're offering and not knowing their pricing and, you know, being told that value, how they value themselves is reflected in their pricing. Like to me, this is a key part of that because if you have an offering that has those three layers and is firmly rooted with that bottom layer, then you get it in yourself. You get a real sense of its value. Therefore the pricing would flow easier. Do you, in your opinion, is that true? Well, yeah. I mean, cause everyone's like, uh, how do I feel more confident about it? And first of all, there's a whole conversation to have about, the incredible poverty in this culture of believing in ourselves. You know, the poverty in this culture is not that we don't believe in ourselves, it's that we have to. It's that we have to be the repository for believing in ourselves. In any, um, I don't know, traditional culture worth its salt, 
your belief, everyone else would believe in you for you. Shouldn't be your job. That's too big for, for you as a mm -hmm. job. Everybody mm -hmm. else should be, uh, you know, you should have been welcomed into the world um, knowing that you were coming, knowing that you were the, the prayer of your ancestors showing up their best response to the times that you're in and you, that you were coming with your tiny little closed fists because they were carrying something for the world and interviewed in the womb by some medicine man or <clears throat> as you were raised paid attention to what your strengths were and what your gifts were yeah. your needs affirmed and you know and then an initiation to bring you into adult like all of that so it's like this whole idea of us having to believe in ourselves is the problem that's not the solution. The solution is not try to believe in yourself more. That's part of the poverty of this culture. That's the poverty of this culture writing the prescription for itself. Mm. Um, so there's that. But um, a lot of times some people say, well, I want confidence. As if confidence is just something you meditate and it just shows up. But confidence primarily comes from competence. It comes from knowing something. It comes from being good at something. Then you're real confident about it. So yeah, so then somebody's like, wow, you charge a lot. And it's like, yep, because I know this. And there's a certain, uh, you're just kind of comfortable in your own skin about it, you know, and, and you don't need to justify it. So this whole idea of like, I need to go to therapy to figure out oh, why am I not confident? It's like, save yourself some money and get really good at something. Get to know a particular piece of land. You know, it's like craftsmanship. Being an artisan takes time. Mm. Um, and you, you get good at something, you know a certain place, and best place to start is like, yeah, what have I already overcome in my life is the shortcut. What have I struggled with that I've overcome? Um, so to get away from this whole thing of like, yeah, and then the more competent you are, the more you can kind of sit with it. It's like, what, uh, what's the amount to charge that feels right here mm. based on my lifestyle desires, based on the amount of experience and skill I have, based on my business model and you know how I price different things and like you just start to get a sense of that and then you sit with it and you're like oh yeah this is the amount that feels right rather mm -hmm. than charging what you deserve is like the huge red herring which of mm -hmm. course only ever goes up I should just be charging more and more, and more. yeah yeah <laughs> that's a good one yeah. yeah I like it um this is yeah as I said has so many applications I love that if you can actually create your map your compass and your route you have an offer that's in integrity, you know, it's based, it's firmly rooted in experience and then determining your pricing from there. I'm, I imagine is very natural. So I just, I want to very briefly touch on this before we finish up. And that is your approach to pricing is rogue of course because that's like everything that you do right <laughs> so you you know you run workshops around the country and you don't have a fixed price pay what you want so people come to your workshop and pay at the end whatever price they feel it's worth you also offer fixed pricing for your coaching services private coaching you sell digital products on your website at a fixed price um, so you've got this whole mix um, in your approach to pricing so how like is that something that has evolved over time and how has it evolved how that it? way and why does it feel good to you well yeah this is the short answer um the first thing i say is not everything i do is rogue um <laughs> really <laughs> no i mean part of the um i'll just push back on that a bit because i don't think it's healthy for people to have this sense of like everything I, that I do needs to be rogue, that everything in this industry is bullshit. And so I'm going to be different than everything. I'm just going to look at what's happening. I'm going to do it different to be rogue and maverick because that means I'm more authentic and I'm more real because I'm not doing what everyone else is doing. You know, there's a reason that people do things the way they <laughs> do it. There's a reason certain things are an industry norm. Not everything should be questioned like that. You know, things that are troubling, let's question those first. Maybe we can get to the other things and question everything later. But so, no, not everything I do is, is rogue or maverick, and I wouldn't recommend that to anybody. Um, but, okay, so having said that. Um, yeah, so the pay what you can thing, that, yeah, there's a whole, I mean, this itself could be a whole hour-long conversation. But... 
there's a lot of different ways to price and it's just good. It's a kind of liberating idea to be like, Oh, I don't have to price for price everything the same way. I mean, there's four main alternatives I can think of. One is there's this kind of gift economy where you just do your work and people pay if they want or not, <coughs> you know, um, or maybe they don't even pay you, but they receive something from you and they give it to somebody else and everybody's giving gifts to each other. So there's that as a, as a model and as a economy that has existed and still exists in certain places in the world. There's barter, where we trade, where, you know, okay, well, I'll give you a massage and you help me fix my computer. There's sliding scale, where I say, well, I charge between this amount and this amount. You can pay on the low end or the high end based on what you can afford. And then I just pay what you can, which is just more open. That just says, hey, yeah, you know, kind of uh, maybe here's what I would charge, but you can really just pay uh, more than that. You can pay less than that, pay whatever you want, pay based on what you can afford um, and what you thought it was worth. So there's those four, and it's just good to know that those are all options, A, but also that you uh, could do different things in different arenas of your business. I know some people, they, uh, their one-on-one -on -one stuff is pay what you can, but they charge a flat fee for everything else, for the workshops, for the products, etc. I know people who do uh, their products online, that's the pay what you can, or sliding scale, you know, or three options, low, medium, high and they charge full price for everything else. For me, it's the live workshops. I do those pay what you can, but I charge a flat fee for one-on-one -on -one coaching and um, flat fee for um, <coughs> the products on my website. So, you know, it's, it's um, you just have options and there's no right way to do it. There's no one business model like, oh yeah, this is what you do is, you know, it always works like this. Um, yeah, and so it has evolved for me over time. I've uh, figured out different tricks and approaches that seem to make it work better and be more sustainable for me. But the thing is, is like, yeah, is it in alignment with your values and your politics? Is it, um, uh, is it accessible to people, the people you'd like to be able to reach? And then is it sustainable for you? That's, those are the three questions. Yeah. Because there's nothing particularly noble about like, uh, collapsing and being a martyr and going broke that doesn't make you more spiritual I mean it doesn't make you less spiritual it's just disconnected from that whole conversation about your value or your worth or your authenticity like shit if being lazy and disorganized were a key to authenticity I'd be I'd have it made you know, <laughs> you know like it's, it's not like I wish I wish like my incapacity of writing uh short blog posts sometimes made me more authentic but it's not it's just not any of that neither is the pricing mm. you know to be like oh they do pay what you can so they're more spiritual more authentic it's just like bullshit mm. it's like yeah i do pay what you can also because i'm a single guy i'm a single white man in north america living in canada where i have health care mm. it's easy for me I would not recommend that for everybody else. And I teach workshops on how to make money, which is the easiest thing for pay, which you get, you know, because then of course people well, does make me money so I can afford to give, you know, they can kind of rationalize giving more. So there's a lot of things, there's a reasons that in, for me, where this, so again, it's like a particular place, particular time. So this, I would, you know, if somebody else was like, yeah, I'm a, you know, living in North America, Canada, and I've got healthcare and, I want to travel around and see the world. I'd be like, yeah, paper scan is easy. Yeah. And I'm not saying I wouldn't recommend it for anyone else. I'm just saying there's a reason I've done it in the way yeah. that I've done it. Um, and there's a particular place I'm in that that point of view came out of. Yeah. And things that I noticed, I'm like, oh, this makes it easier for me. You know, it works. It's like easier to promote the workshops. I mean, there's a lot of selfless reasons to do it, but there's more selfish reasons to do it, frankly. Because it's like, yeah, when I travel, it's easy. People spread the word because they like the vibe of pay what you can. Um, you know, when I ask people in workshops, I'm like, raise your hand. People would come to this day long workshop if it was $200. And um, nobody raises their hand. Or like one or two people <laughs> raise yeah. their hand. I'm like, Ta -da. so it's like selfishly, like, this works better for me. Mm. Um, you know, just as a st strategic thing. So it's, you know, I don't know, this whole like, I'm just going to go rogue and do everything totally authentic and fuck them in and all these, uh, uh, it's like, that's great. I mean, good luck with it. And strategic is okay. It's okay to think things through. Be like, well, what's the lifestyle I want? What's the business model that makes sense to me? And then how do I price it in a way that's sustainable for me, but also mm -hmm. accessible for the people I want to reach? 
and you just be thoughtful about it. You just think it through and, and there's no right answer. There's no one true way to do this. Mm. Yeah, I love it. It's actually, you know, the two key questions of, you know, what feels good to me and what's sustainable for me. If people answered those two questions and had no expectation about what they should be charging or what pricing model they use, um, yeah. my goodness, it could transform so much for, as you know, in terms of how people feel about earning the money they earn. Yeah. Um, so I love that you represent that and you've got a very grounded perspective on it. Um, and on that note, thank you so much, Tad. <laughs> what was that? We went over the 30 minutes we were originally thinking uh, about. But... Yeah, we did. That was a lot to cover. <laughs> thank you so much for your brilliant work. And I'll, I'll include a link to Tad's point of view uh, marketing book ebook below this video.